John here from RipeWave Audio, and I'm here today with the Onkyo TXRZ50 AV receiver. And while this model was released a few years ago in 2021, it's still relevant today because when Onkyo released their latest model, the TXRZ70, I heard feedback from a lot of you that says, well, that's nice, but I'm still focused on the TXRZ50 because of its price. Now, speaking of price, the price has kind of varied around a bit on this. When it was first released, I believe that it went for $1,399. And since then, they raised the price up to $1,599. So moved up a few hundred dollars. But now we're seeing that they are putting it on sale for $1,299, which is actually $100 lower than what it sold for in 2021. So I said they're playing some games back and forth with the, the price. In fact, uh, you might even find some deals that are lower than that. But regardless of the case, this is a unit that does 12 channels of processing, which translates into a 7.1.4 unit. And it's dot one for the subwoofer or low frequency because its subwoofer outputs are wired in parallel. So you're not gonna get independent control of the subwoofers as you do with their now flagship model, the TXRZ70, which is a true 13 channels of processing, 7.2.4. So we're bringing this in house and we're gonna see how it compares against our Marantz Cinema 50, as well as our Emotiva RMC1 AV processor. And I know every time I introduce the Emotiva RMC into a comparison against some receivers uh, at a price range lower than the RMC1, you're saying it's not a fair comparison, but we always compare whether they're in the same weight class or not. And I do wanna say something about Onkyo. Now this is the first Onkyo unit I brought in for evaluation in recent years since I started this channel. But Onkyo was actually the first AV receiver which I recommended to buy back in the 1980s. So I convinced my father, and up until that point, he had always selected the hi-fi components. In fact, what he had at the time was a receiver, a Marantz, uh, 2275, which is that very classic look, and he had the wood case to go with it, and uh, 75 watts, two channels. Uh, of course, it had a, a rear channels as well, so you could actually drive four speakers with it, but it was not surround sound. And at this time, in the late 80s, surround sound was just starting to take hold. Dolby Surround had been introduced, I think, around 1982. We can confirm that, but it wasn't until... 1987, where we started to see AV receivers include the Dolby Surround uh, codec for decoding from VHS tapes and, and other sources. And the Onkyo TXSV7 was among the first to offer this. And I went back and I actually found a uh, story review buyer's guide from that era, and this is from 1989, but that model was still being sold, and I found it very interesting. Of the 55 uh, AV receivers that are listed as AV receivers in that buyer's guide from 1989, because uh, most of them were still just putting out stereo receivers, but AV receivers didn't necessarily mean you had surround sound in that day. An AV receiver meant that you were able to take in video sources with that capability of being able to bring in video sources and have maybe a TV tuner in there. And MTS decoding constituted what was required to call it an AV receiver. You did not have to have any surround sound capabilities whatsoever. So of the 55 models which were advertised as AV receivers, only 25 of them had surround sound capabilities, or 45%. Now, when I look through the list, uh, they're supporting surround sound in different ways. So three of them just said 
that they support matrix surround. No, no word about Dolby. Another three said they had surround sound capability. Those were the Sony models. And in fact, I looked at even the ES top of the line models from Sony of the day. Those were just receivers. But they did have some models like their STR AV900 sold for $480 and just had surround sound capability, whatever that means. Uh, and then you had 15 models that actually marketed as Dolby Surround, 27% of what was called an AV receiver in those days. And um, of those, the Onkyo was one of them. They had also models from Carver, JVC, Kenwood, NEC, Philips, Sherwood, Technics, and Vector Research, if you remember some of those brands that may not, ex don't really exist today. But there were four models that had introduced Dolby Pro Logic, and they were only from Pioneer. So models like the VSX 9300S, which was their top of the line, $935, had Dolby Pro Logic. But for whatever reason, I recommended to my dad to get the Onkyo TXSV7, which sold for around the same price, uh, 90 watts for the front channels and only 20 watts for the rear. And most of those uh, receivers of those days, if they had rear surround sound, it was a fraction of the wattage for those rear channels. Uh, most of those models, I think there was one I found that, uh, that, that kept it all to all four, but that was common in the day. So that's my history with Onkyo. Uh, it was an okay unit. It did its job, but of course ProLogic came in right on its heels, and then Onkyo came out with, I believe it was their SV70 uh, Pro in 1990 that continued things on, but they only had one model in 1989, from 87 to 89, that had surround sound. So there's the history lesson. Let's take this thing out of the box and see what we have. So here is the remote. Now these remotes are shared with also their Pioneer and Integra uh, brands, the Onkyo ones have a yellow button on them. Uh, so this is the remote that comes with it. Then we have some packaging in here. Looks like some sort of manual, as well as the antennas. So we have an an so we have an antenna. We have a calibration mic. Now remember that these new Onkyo models, not only do they support Dirac, but they support their own proprietary uh, room calibration. This looks like another antenna. You have in here too the batteries for the remote. And we've got a registration card, safety information, and notes about product support and the various centers around the world that support this. And it said it's manufactured by Onkyo Technologies in Japan. I don't know if that's still the case. We also have a web page guide, a voice control guide. These are just single sheets. And we have initial setup which opens up into poster format to guide you through those initial steps. And we read manuals. I don't discard those. I read them and I try to see if there's discrepancies in the manuals. And they also, I find them helpful. We have an IEC power cord. So we'll get this one out of the bag. nice when they have removable power cords. And this is packaged in here with foam. And 
wrapped in some foam. And there it is, the Onkyo TXRZ50, and we'll take a little look at this uh, together now. Now we have this, now that we have this unboxed, we take a look at its physical size, and this is pretty large. Uh, of course, it's got the standard 17-inch width, but height-wise, it's 8 inches with the feet on, and of course, the uh, instruction sheets say, do not install this without the feet. Don't take those off. We need the air circulation around it. Uh, it's slightly taller than our RMC-1, which to date has been the largest thing that we brought in. So this is a tall unit uh, that we have here. Now this first thing that they say to do is plug it into the TV so you can do the setup with the on-screen menus. So we're going to put the power cord in, we're going to give it an HDMI cable, and uh, see how it goes. Now what we're going to do first though is when we run ours, our initial setup is going to be uh, not using the amplifiers. We're going to do everything with external amps because I want to do that apples to apples comparison. Running my Cinema 50 and my RMC1 using the same amps and the same speakers, how close do we get? Does this sound as good, a little better, a little less? We'll figure that out. And then once we've kind of figured it out with the same amps, then we're going to try again with the front channels, we're going to run the front channels from this comparing against the front channels, let's say, of the Cinema 50 and see how that compares. Now what this has for amplification, a 9 by 120 watt amplifier. So this is pretty powerful for as far as a receiver goes. Now you can go back to the videos what I did a couple years ago as well as the one I did for the TXRZ. 70, which compares uh, the feature sets. But I'll just tell you here that you know, the lo logos that they have across the top edge of this, uh, this Onkyo and Integra are the only brands I know of that are getting their receivers THX certified, and this has that logo on there. This has Dolby Atmos, it has DTSX, IMAX, Dolby Vision, PlayFi, Wi-Fi, Dirac, and VLSC, whatever that means. That's what they have across the top here. Oh, and there's a Bluetooth logo. It's in very faint lettering, so you can barely see it, but that's a little bit of advertising. That's what they feel is going to uh, sell this unit. This does not have Oral 3D support that the RZ70 has, so I'd like to get the RZ70 in so we can do that comparison as well, but we're starting with the RZ50 because that's what a lot of you wanted to uh, see. All right, as I said, we're going to be hooking this up uh, of all external amplifiers to begin with. We've got our snakes here. We have one snake here for the right channel and the other snake here for the left channel, and they're all color-coded. These wire up to our ABC switchers here so we can do our comparisons against the Cinema 50 and the Emotiva RMC1. So we'll try to do this so you can see it. Because these snakes are made up of balance cables, I have adapters on each one of these to bring it to RCA. And what I'll do is I'm going to start with the right channel. And we're going to plug this in to the pre-outs on this unit. So one thing I'll show you here is with adapters on, all these adapters for the right channel have a red color on it. And then the other color tells me the, uh, the speaker that it's going to. So if I start with red here, which stands for my front speakers, right here, red right, that goes there. Then green is my center channel. Plug that in here, and then we do the surround channel. The surround channel we're using blue, so that goes the right surround. Rear surround we're using brown. Untangle these as we do it. Okay, right after surround they've got height, so I've got to skip one and go to surround back here. 
And then for my first height, I'm using the color yellow. So I can plug that in here. This is subwoofer. So my subwoofers are uh, in purple. And then we finally have height two. We're going to be wiring this up as 7.2.4. So we have four, two rows of height speakers mounted in the ceiling. And there's all the right channel. And we're not going to bother with the second zone. Then we have our left channel snake here. And on our adapters, the uh, band is black, but at the end there's a white band here. So white goes into the white left channel. Uh, the red, of course, it was our front. So front, left. Then there's no center, so we skip the green color. And then we move on to the surround, which is blue. Then as remember, we had height one, so that's yellow. Then we have surround back, which is brown. Then we have our subwoofer. Now these are wired in parallel, but I can still take my second sub and wire that in there. And then we have our second height, and this is the orange, and that's it. So all my pre-outs are done. Now what I like to do, at least for these evaluations, is if they have suggested uh, HDMI labels here, I use those. So they're saying that Blu-ray goes in one, so I'll put my Blu-ray player in source one, and we've got game, cable satellite, streaming box. Okay, this will be my Apple TV. And then PC, etc. And then we've got an Ethernet connection. Yeah, I don't have enough length on my Ethernet, but when I turn this around, I'll plug my Ethernet cable right into here. And that will give us a good start for wiring up this Onkyo TXRZ. 50. Now while we're using HDMI for our sources, our digital sources, we could have used a, a couple of other different options there. The uh, RZ50 does have one coax and one uh, Toslink input, so if you have those digital audio inputs, that is supported by one each. And then as far as two-channel analog, it supports six different inputs, and it does have a phono input. And looking at the map that came with it, uh, it has the suggested usage for the analog are uh, DVD, game, cable satellite, streaming box, CD player, TV, and the last one being phono, which is a moving magnet, uh, phono cartridge uh, there. Now this does give you one component and two composite inputs for video, so if you do have some of that older legacy uh, video, then you do have that support on the back of it. So that's all outlined in that setup guide that you have there. The initial setup guide really only goes over 7.1 configurations, but of course we're going to add the four ceiling channels as well. So what we're going to do is power this on. Now that I have this powered to the wall, you can see there's a yellow indicator in the front here. We can open up this door, which just kind of seen it snaps into place there and you pull it down it's and then here's the extra button uh, these I think are just here for uh, shipping this little label will pull off and these pads will pull off uh, post shipping here now we're ready to do the initial setup and when you power this on it will default to the initial setup if you want to return to the initial setup, I found the way to do this is in your manual. It says resetting the unit. While you're powering on, push the cable button, which is this third from the, the edge button at the top, and the power button. It will say clear, and then you wait, and then it will do a power down. And then when the next time you turn it on, it will turn back with the factory defaults. What I've done at this point is I've diverted the television signal 
to my computer so I can record that directly and you'll have a clearer picture of what the initial setup looks like. So with this going, we use our remote. We've got our remote powered on here and using the enter and the arrow buttons, I can then hit the next button uh, once we get on the initial setup here. Uh, just says prepare all your connections first. Uh, what I found is in these setup guides here, they assume that you have a 7.1 system for initial setup. We're ultimately trying to get to a 7.1.4 system. I also th believe that they assume that you're using the internal amplifiers, which we are not. But we'll keep going here. So they're saying follow the guide. It's included in the box. Uh, they're going to have you do a speaker setup. They're going to have you do a multi-zone sound check. We're not using a second zone, but if you are, that's your second check. Then the, for the third, they're going to have you do ARC setup. We don't use ARC because we send our sources directly into the receiver, but if you are, that's the third set. And we'll probably show you that at some point of how that works, just to prove it out. And then the fourth step is the Dirac live setup. So would you like to start these initial setups? We'll say yes. The setup will assist you through your speakers correctly. Would you like to continue? Yes. What they've done is set this up very graphically, very much like Den and Morantz does. We like that. So it's showing you here a 7.1.2 setup. Uh, we have two subwoofers and two, four uh, ceiling speakers. So we're going to have a 7.2.4. However, according to this, it will always show up as a 7.1.4 because it only wires the subwoofers in parallel. And you can see here we can cycle through the different choices. I'm going to step ahead here for a second because I want to start here at the most basic configuration it supports. 2.1. And it shows you graphically two speakers in the front and one subwoofer. Of course, the subwoofer could be anywhere in your room, but they show it in the front. Could be a 3.1 with a center channel added. It could be a 4.1 with some rear surrounds. It could be a 5.1 with the rear surrounds and center channel. 6.1 now having the side and rear surrounds. 7.1 side rear surrounds plus the center channel. And now a 2.1.2. So this is nothing on the rear or sides, but we're using two ceiling speakers. Uh, some of you may do this because you have a constrained room and you have nowhere to mount rear or side surround speakers. You can also do this as 3.1.2. You can do it as and this is what we're aiming for with our setup, which is the largest configuration that the TXRZ50 supports. So if you have front wide speakers, this model isn't going to be for you because there's no nine channel setup, no front wide support. We're going to have a subwoofer, so this will be yes. If you don't have a subwoofer, you can turn that on, and you can see the image re removes from the picture. But we're going to leave it as subwoofer on. Height 1. This defaults to middle. Now, this can be positioned in different places. Uh, you could be as simple as using the Dolby Atmos reflective speakers on your front. This could be front height speakers. This could be top front speakers. That's what we have and of course the middle that we started with. So we'll leave it at top front, then we'll switch to height two speakers, which we do have, but you don't have to use it with this unit. So it defaults uh, to rear height. Uh, could be also the Dolby reflective surround speakers as put on a side surround. It could be Dolby speakers uh, that are on the back. You have it could be a top rear speaker. We're going to leave this as top rear. Zone speaker, you can set this to zone 2 or no. And we're going to put it on no for ours. 
uh, zone two pre-out, it defaults to zone two, but it could also be zone B. Doesn't matter to us, we'll just leave it zone two. And speaker impedance. Now, not all our speakers are rated at the same impedance. Most of them are four ohm. So because they don't seem to allow us to select this differently for different speakers, the worst case we have is four ohm. Of course, we're using pre-outs on our case, so I'm not sure this is really going to matter because this would be tied into the amplifiers that are built in. But it's nice to see that they go down to 4 ohm on their support. You could also to 6 ohms above, uh, and those are the two choices. So once this is good, we hit the Enter button. It locks in that configuration, and we have a chance to review that. This all looking good, we're going to hit Yes or Next. So now it's the test tones. So I'll take this off a of mute here. It's doing front left. And don't hit enter because that's going to take you out of test tone. If you want to hear all these and test all your speakers, you're going to have to hit the down arrow to hit each of these. So we've got the center, the right, the height one left, height one right, height two left, height two right, Surround right, surround back right, surround back left, surround left, and subwoofer. So the O's all work. Now I hit enter. They did come out the test tones. I'm going to hit next. And they were coming out the right speakers. That's another good thing uh, on that. I ran the ARC setup, which caused me to disconnect from the computer recording for a little bit. Uh, because it had to run through my actual TV. In this case, to use ARC, I had to plug a source directly into the TV, and then on the ARC input for the television, had to connect that to the ARC output of the Onkyo receiver. And so I just said yes on the prompt, and then it just moved to the next step after blacking out for a few seconds where it made its adjustments and then it has you do room equalization and it drops you right into Dirac Live which is I find interesting they're not starting with their own built-in one or we can exit Dirac Live and go to AccuEQ which is what Onkyo used to use up until these models that came into play in 2021 but we prefer Dirac Live we believe we'll also try it with AccuEQ and let you know those differences in a future video they are having you use the setup mic that came with this, so there's no need to buy a UMIC one or any other mic. So they just have you plug this in the front of the box. Now we're here with the initial setup for the room EQ. So this is to calibrate the room and get the best sound quality with the microphone. Would you like to calibrate the room now? Well, yes. So we're gonna say enter. So they're giving you a choice here to start the Dirac Live through this wizard or to exit Dirac Live and use Onkyo's AccuEQ. We're going to try Direct Live to start with. We'll come back at a later date and try AccuEQ and, if possible, compare the two. Dirac Live requires a network connection. So let's continue with the network setup, and I have this hardwired with an Ethernet cable. It's saying, would you like to use Chromecast built in? Uh, I don't have a Chromecast account, so I'm going to say no. Which connection would you like to use, wired or wireless? I'm going to choose wired, but we can also use wireless. There are antennas on the back of this unit. So you don't have to rely on a separate access point. You can do Wi-Fi directly to this. But I'm going to use wired. And click yes to make the connection. Oh, it's working this time. It got the MAC address, IP address, gateway. So it did a ping test successful and an internet service test successfully. So we are good with the wired connection. Now it's asking us to plug in the wireless microphone. This is the microphone that came with it. I've attached it to a 
tripod here with a, a microphone boom, and I had to get a microphone to uh, camera type adapter on this. This is a, a nice uh, swivel uh, ball joint here, which I can pivot in every direction. I'm going to point this one facing up, and this is the microphone that came with it. And we're going to take this eighth inch phono plug and plug it in right here. Uh, by the way, I am leaving this protective film on now, and uh, I tend to return these units. I can't keep buying and keeping AV receivers, so I'm going to leave that protective film in, but you'd be uh, taking that off. Uh, so follow the app's instructions to continue. Do not unplug the setup microphone. So I've got to follow the app's instructions. So I take that to be the Dirac Live app. So I got over my other computer. I already have the latest version of Dirac on my other computer. I'll bring that over and let's see if it detects the Onkyo uh, TXRZ50. Now this will be interesting because I normally, when running Dirac with either Marantz Cinema 50, the RMC1, or with the Mini DSP, I am using my UMIC-1 that is USB connected to the laptop. So we already had Dirac Live 3 installed on our laptop, and because we have used it with other receivers and processors. This time, though, when we started up, it immediately recognized the Onkyo TXRZ50, them being both on the same uh, network, uh, the laptop is actually on a wirelessly connected to the network, and the Onkyo is wired connected to the network, but they're on the same network. Uh, but I think this has come up immediately because the license is included with the Onkyo, and it didn't have to be added like the Marantz Cinema 50. So we're going to go and select that. As I said on the Onkyo setup screens, follow the screen now for the Dirac Live. Now they give you a choice of microphones. Uh, we, it does recognize the TXRZ50 as a microphone. So we're going to use that. Now I bet it would probably work with my UMIC-1 if I had plugged it into the USB. Just out of curiosity, I'm going to also hook up my UMIC-1 to the laptop that is running Dirac Live. And I bet it's going to recognize both microphones. We are going to go through this with the microphone that Onkyo provides with it, just to get that full Onkyo experience. You know, if we're not happy with the results, and it does support this UMIC-1, uh, why not run it again with the UMIC-1? Something that we already trust. I would assume that the microphone that's come with the Onkyo is really not calibrated for each unit. It's a general profile for everything that comes out of manufacturing versus this UMIC-1 is serialized and the curve that we get for this, the calibration file, is specific to this exact serial number. And I did plug this in and when I did that, it did discover the UMIC-1. But I am going to continue, I'll unplug the UMIC-1 and I am going to continue on this path with the Onkyo microphone. So let's do that and proceed to calibration. And this is going to the volume calibration. And I'm assuming this will calibrate just like we did with the RMC-1 and other products. Now I'll put the uh, microphone at the main listening position now and uh, we'll start from there. I got through the Dirac uh, calibration process and when it was finished, you could select the filters as normally you can do. I selected the default, and then we get a choice of three slots that we could store this in on the Onkyo. We pick slot one, we gave it a name and a description, and we are now uh, done with that part of the process. I'm going to hit enter, and it says, uh, now we get to unplug the microphone from the Onkyo. That loads it into memory. It looks like 
It is now complete with the setup wizard. We can use our Onkyo TXRZ50. So what we're gonna do is our first try here, we're gonna set this to use our Apple TV. And Apple TV is set to our stream box and we can you know, just hit that enter on the Onkyo and that will bring it up. If we hit information on the Onkyo, it will tell us that this is uh, coming in at uh, multi-channel PCM 5.1. Uh, we can try different songs in here. Uh, I've been listening to this Robert Cray quite a bit lately. We can put that on. If I hit the info button on the remote, it toggles between telling us what's going on with the audio channels. So we're saying we're doing 7.1 bot 4 is what we expect. Dolby audio surround. And uh, the source is 5.1 multi-channel PCM. We hit this again, we get the video information saying it's coming in at 4K, 59 hertz. I don't know why it's saying 59. I, I'm assuming that really means 60. I'll just take that as a small uh, bug. But, you know, this is running. And what I want to do is try to find an, an Atmos track and see if it will pick up on that. Here's a Dolby Atmos track. And it's registering as Dolby Atmos 7.1.4. Streaming it at 48 kilohertz is what we expect from an Apple TV device. They normalize everything to 48K. And we'll try some other devices just so we know that we can get it, get the uh, full 192-bit uh, streaming into this as well. So this is looking good so far. I think this is a good place to really pause where we're at on this initial review. It's been going for a while here. I'll be back with some more commentary on what I think the Onkyo TXRZ50 sounds like, how it compares with the Cinema 50, and the Emotiva RMC1. Until then, what's your thoughts on the Onkyo TXRZ50? Is this something that interests you? Of course, if you're not going beyond 7.1.4, this might be a pretty good unit for you. Uh, and when we finally get those results in from the Cinema 50, who, which also play in the space, albeit at more money, that's a $2,500 unit, and this one is well under $2,000, uh, depending on what you get it at. So what are your thoughts on this model? Uh, did you enjoy this video? Uh, please comment uh, below. That would be very helpful to this community. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If you want to take your membership to the next level, uh, consider joining our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash RipeWave. You can always give us a one-time donation by hitting that thanks button. That would be really appreciated. But you can always... Just hit that bell icon at no cost to you to be notified when the next video is posted. Until then, keep evolving your audio experience.